Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Hello and welcome to the SEI podcast series. My name is Eileen Rubel and I'm a technical director here at the Software Solutions Division at the Software Engineering Institute. Joining me today is Tom Evans and Dr. Doug Schmidt. Tom is a senior software architect in our Software Solutions Division working out of our Boston office. And Doug is the Associate Provost for Research Development and Technologies at Vanderbilt University. He's the co-director of Vanderbilt's Data Science Institute, as well as the Cornelius Vanderbilt Professor of Engineering, Professor of Computer Science. Previously, Doug served as the Chief Technical Officer at the SEI, and he continues to collaborate with us on various projects, such as the ones we're about to discuss today. Welcome to both of you. So before we get started, I'd like for both of you to tell our audience a little bit about yourself and what brought you to the SCI and the kind of work that you do here, especially with respect to DOD programs. Um, And I'll start with Doug. I've been working with the SCI since roughly 2005. I worked initially on a project related to ultra-large scale systems. It was quite fascinating, had a big influence and impact on the research community 15 years or so ago. From 2010 to 2012, I was the chief technology officer at the SCI. And since that point, I've been working on many other projects together with Tom and other colleagues. What I find most fascinating about the SEI is the chance to work on cutting edge projects that really make a difference in terms of the nation's defense, in terms of being able to make our defense industry base and commercial companies and government agencies more effective at applying software to meet their mission needs. And we're really lucky to have an organization like the SEI to play this role because software is more and more important and many other organizations are not able to bridge the gap that the SAI can from advanced research all the way into cutting edge practice and making these projects work and the technologies work for real systems and real environments. Thanks, Doug. And Tom, can you tell us a little about yourself? Uh, sure. Thank you, Eileen. And uh, thanks to Doug and all the collaborators on this series. I actually grew up in the Pittsburgh area and received an undergraduate degree in computer engineering from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, After which I moved to Boston and I've spent about 25 years in the Boston tech scene. And while being well aware of SEI, I never really thought this is where I would be. Uh, A few years back, I had a particularly frustrating day at a job at a small company that I was hating. And the software there was and still likely is an ancient, tragic mess. And my efforts to modernize it were met with a lot of resistance. And I recall thinking to myself, these folks don't care about quality of this product or how difficult it is to maintain and the fact that it's deployed into some very important public infrastructure situations. Uh, That day I came home from work and decided it's time to go. I logged into LinkedIn and upgraded my membership. And the first job recommendation I received uh, was for the SEI. And I remember thinking to myself, why am I seeing this? And as I read the description, my thoughts changed to, I've done all of this and this kind of work actually matters. Uh, So in the end, I was hired to support a Boston location for SEI and to work efforts in the Boston area. The work I've done at SEI today has involved software architectural and design analysis of Air Force and Navy systems, um, specifically focusing on modernization of those systems with emphasis on open systems and architectures. Thanks, Tom. And so I'm going to build on that. In the last few months, uh, you two, along with Mike Gagliardi, Nicholas Reimer, and Joe Kostel, uh, you've published a series of SEI blog posts outlining issues that the DOD needs to consider as software sustainment teams transition more into software engineering roles. Before we talk about those issues, um, I'd like to take a step back and talk about how software sustainment Uh, in the DOD sense is different from software engineering and why DOD teams are making this transition. Uh, Tom, I'd like to start with you. Cool, thank you. Uh, So uh, sustainment focuses on addressing the needs of already deployed systems. Um, And sustainment usually focuses on the rapid repair of problems that are found in deployment and in operational use. Uh, I tend to think of sustainment as brownfield work or dot release work, uh, whereas engineering is usually focusing on new features and the next big major release. And so in engineering, uh, the work is much more greenfield, meaning that the field is green and there are no existing structures on it. And teams are making these transitions for a few reasons. 
Uh, first, there's a general shortage of, of software expertise out there. And that fact is only expected to worsen over time. So in many ways, it's all hands on deck. And the belief is that there's a short bridge from sustainment to engineering. Um, second, especially in DoD work, there's a lot of proprietary software and that has many non-functional um, drawbacks, specifically uh, in terms of proprietary, uh, the proprietary nature of, of that software. And in those cases, it's often the case that only that original contractor is able to modify or fix or enhance those systems. And so that limits competition and usually ends up uh, costing taxpayers more in the long run. Uh, with these factors, a possible answer is maybe we can do it ourselves within within the DoD, or at least some major portions of the software can be developed internally and organically. Um, and so what does the DoD have already is a lot of sustainment organizations. And so the belief is that, hey, we can kickstart this engineering effort by using the sustainment more or these sustainment organizations. And I mean, right, I mean, development and sustainment is just the same, right? Thanks, Tom. Doug, do you want to build on that? Yes. So about a decade ago, when I was the chief technology officer at the SEI, I served on a study at the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board looking at sustaining aging aircraft. And one of the things we discovered during our study was that the Air Force was spending a lot of money on sustaining the software portions of these aircraft. And there was some concern that at the time, a lot of the aircraft that were getting into the sustainment phase were the very complicated ones, like F-22 and the Joint Strike Fighter. And that was going to cost quite a bit of money using the contractor-based sustainment. So there was a real push in the government to try to move towards so-called organic sustainment where it's done by the government. And I think to build off of what Tom said, people are realizing that if the government can do sustainment of complex systems, such as Joint Strike Fighter or F-22, they also perhaps would have the skills and capabilities to do development of these complex systems as well. And part of what we're describing in our studies that we've done and, and the various blogs that we've written is the fact that developing software isn't necessarily the same thing as sustaining or maintaining it. And you have to take into account different skill sets and different factors and forces that may or may not make it easy to take the same set of people and apply them in one context as successfully as you've been able to apply them in another. So, so you two have recently uh, written this blog post series, um, and you talk about the differences in uh, technical perspective and technical focus of developers working in greenfield versus brownfield situations. And I'm wondering if you can expand on that a little bit for our listeners. I'll start with Doug. Sure, you bet. So typical people who develop greenfield systems, the ones that are not yet built, have to have a tremendous amount of knowledge of software engineering concepts such as software architecture and software design and optimization techniques and so on because they're really trying to create something that may not exist at that point. So there's a certain level of expertise, a certain amount of creativity, a certain ability to, to work with things where the answers aren't necessarily known at the beginning. Historically, people in contrast to do the sustainment part are given many of those artifacts they're given test systems, they're given architectures, they're given detailed designs, they're given everything laid down ahead of time. And so their job is just to make sure that those systems continue to work properly as they're being evolved and improved. And that's often a very different skill set, just in the same way that people who are great at starting companies aren't necessarily the same people who are good at running them down the road. People who are great at building systems aren't necessarily the ones who are best served to sustain and maintain them and, and vice versa. So I think part of what we're doing in this blog series is trying to help people recognize that there are different skills and talents and core competencies between different types of developers working in different contexts. Tom, is there anything you'd like to add? Sure. So uh, you may not have picked up on my little joke there at the end that sustainment and development are the same, right? Um, and I think Doug is, is, is uh, pulling that thread a little bit more for sure. Um, People who do sustainment are often thrown into situations where they don't know the, the overall picture. And they're able to narrow it down and fix a particular issue without understanding the entirety of the system. Engineering often requires the, the breadth of knowledge for that entire system. So while the skills may be transferable or transitionable between the two, it is a different mindset and a different approach to look at, 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 at those two different forms of engineering. What I'd like to talk about now is the, the specific challenges that teams are encountering, encountering as they have to make this transition from um, 
focusing more on software sustainment challenges and moving more into de software and system development roles. Uh, in the blog posts, uh, you've broken these into you know, three, area, three main areas, uh, people, process, and technology. And so I'm wondering if the two of you can talk to me a little bit more about some of the more pressing issues that you've, uh, that you've observed in each of these areas and some strategies for how to address them. Um, and so I'll start with Tom and ask you uh, maybe to talk about, uh, let's start with process. Um, in my observation uh, with process, the, the biggest hurdles to overcome are what I think of as the rigid interpretations of what is the trendy software process of the day. Um, I often think that process itself is software and should be modifiable by the, the people involved in that process. I mean, I think even in the Agile uh, manifesto, there was this um, idea that you know process and teams grow organically from, from the team. And so uh, what I've often seen is people, especially leadership will walk into, a, an, a, into an effort and just throw down, this is what the process is gonna be. And that may not be what other people have experienced in process. And so there needs to be a certain amount of level setting there um, and determining what team members agree as to the definition of certain concepts like architecture and MVP and, and what is simple. Um, because you know, Agile, for instance, talks a lot about simple solutions and there's surprisingly a lot of disagreement about what is simple. And so getting that all set up before you launch into writing code is super important. But more importantly to me and to things I've seen is remove that rigidity, remove that, that resistance to hearing what other people think the process can be or can incorporate. Thanks, Tom. Doug, do you want to expand on the process challenges a bit and then maybe talk to us about uh, differences or challenges in adapting to uh, technology, uh, technology aspects? I think one of the challenges that are faced by people doing sustainment is the fact that a lot of the key decisions have already been made and they often feel that they're forced to live within the Procrustean bed of previous decisions, which, which often uh, formulates the terms of technical debt and things that weren't resolved by the original design team. And so from a process point of view, helping people to see what's fixed and what's variable is very difficult because they oftentimes feel that they have to work very narrowly within a range that they didn't decide. They didn't decide the programming language. They didn't decide the operating system version. They didn't decide the hardware. And yet they have to adapt to perhaps new requirements or bug fixes or optimizations or other types of enhancements within those constraints. In contrast, when people do development, they often have much more leeway at deciding what those decisions will be, deciding what the architecture will be, what the tools will be, what the language is, and so on. And so I think that leads to a very different mindset, and it also leads to perhaps more creativity in the process environment. So you're not necessarily trying to uh, force fit uh, square, square pegs through round holes and vice versa, but instead you're giving people more opportunity to decide how to work together with the original people defining the requirements and deciding what the system should really be. By the time you get to sustainment, those constraints are often much more laid down in stone. And so this often leads to different teams who are in a sense of, if you will, with learned helplessness. They, they are not accustomed to thinking outside the box. They're accustomed to thinking within very rigid constraints. And therefore, it just leads to a different mentality that makes it hard for them later to transition to a more development-centric role where that creativity is paramount, especially in the early phases of a project. So in talking about, we've talked about process, we've talked about technology challenges, um, and we've talked about some of the uh, the, the different mindsets or, or roles associated with software for sustainment and, versus, and software development. What are some of the biggest and most pressing people challenges that you've seen? I'll start with Tom. Sure. Um, so during this whole process, we've, we've, there's been a slight mantra, right? Like people, uh, do what they're incentivized to do. And in sustainment, the rapid repair of defects is what is incentivized, right? So you have people who are on the hook to make somebody's life better with a piece of software as soon as possible. And so there is an incentive there for the rapid resolution of these problems. And uh, that's what the incentive is. And so 
in development, the incentive is often that we don't know how to do something. And so there needs to be a certain amount of effort put into figuring that out. And people in sustainment may become very frustrated with that perspective uh, because they're used to just doing their, their, their entire job is do, 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 do. And they have a lot of this infrastructure already there. They don't need to know how everything works. Um, that's a little bit uh, counter to what happens in, inf- in, 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 in engineering. And so um, in, in software development, engineers need to know little design concepts and patterns, and they need to learn to appreciate the non-functional attributes of a system, you know, like reusability or maintainability or um, separation of concerns. Those aren't often prioritized in a sustainment um, setting. And so level setting and changing that mindset are paramount for for moving somebody from sustainment into into software engineering. Thanks. And Doug, would you like to add anything to that? Sure. So one of the common misperceptions people often have about software developers and software engineers is that they're all plug compatible. One is as good as the other. And one of the things we discover as we get further into this discipline is that there are different people with different skill sets and different roles. And just like with everything else, if you if you go into um, electronics, you find that there are people who are great RF engineers or people who are great at making ASICs or FPGAs. And those skill sets are not necessarily infinitely transmissible and and mutable. So the same thing is true with software development and software sustainment. There are people who are really good at testing. You don't necessarily want those people to be your architects. There are people who are very good at coming up with detailed designs or people who are very good at doing the interfaces of a system. You don't necessarily want them to be doing the implementations. So knowing what skill sets you have and knowing what skill sets are necessary in order to meet the requirements is really an issue of management. And in my experience, a lot of times people who are doing software management or software leadership or leadership of software organizations where they don't have much software background are often very difficult. It's very difficult for them to figure out what kinds of roles they need. And it's also difficult to assess what kinds of skill sets they have with the engineers that are at their disposal to meet those needs. And so trying to get all those different pieces to align in some coherent way is very tricky. So it should be no surprise that when you start taking people who've been kind of trained and honed to do sustainment style tasks, as Tom talks about, and then expect them to do a brand new set of things, it might not be a surprise that they would have difficulty doing that at first, especially if they don't have a budget for mentoring, they don't have a budget for training, they don't have a budget for rebuilding and and reskilling themselves to do these new types of tasks. And one thing that's also very important to realize is that the sustainment world is heavily driven by cost reduction. Unlike development and building systems from scratch, which can often overrun monumentally, as we all know, by looking at large software fiascos, uh, you when you get to the sustainment phase, the budgets are much more fixed and the opportunities to train people and to get them opportunities to learn new skills and new sources of expertise are often very, very limited. They often don't have access, for example, to a research facility the way that you would if you were at a place like Boeing or Lockheed Martin, where they have researchers who can help them keep abreast of the latest and greatest technologies and software advances. So sustainment organizations are oftentimes less full of resources to continually retrain and bring their their staff up to speed with the latest and greatest technologies. So a lot of the challenge there is making sure you have the right people for the right job. So people, of course, are not fungible. As, uh, as I think we're all fond of saying, um, every, every development or sustainment organization has its own, has adopted its own way of doing things, its own set of local processes suitable to the environment and the system that they've been working on. Um, the technology available and the enabling technologies for different systems can be dramatically different, which also goes back to our people fungibility problem. And we're doing all of this in a Um, certainly a fiscally constrained environment. These are hard problems to solve. Uh, What strategies, or I guess what top strategies uh, would you recommend that organizations organizations emphasize to address some of these these critical challenges? I'll start with you, Doug. So first and foremost, it's, it's very important for organizations to realize that core competency in software and software engineering is fundamental to their success. This is becoming more clear nowadays because we've seen the consequences of ignoring that. But many organizations still have a very hardware and traditional platform centric view. And software is typically perceived as a a necessary evil, but it's not really something that they want to be good at. 
So part of the challenge is to make sure that people build a culture where software skills and software talents are recognized and rewarded. And this really comes through with respect to what kind of investment do you make in your people? Do you try to hire the cheapest people you can and then just not give them any training or any education to improve themselves? That's certainly one model. But the problem is that those people are very challenged to keep up with the new threats and the new capabilities that are coming online and the new requirements we see in these modern mission systems in the DoD and elsewhere. So I think my, my first thing is for people to recognize that software is absolutely crucial to their line of business and to treat it the same way that they would treat all the other things that they take seriously, to invest in it, to grow it, to build the competencies, and to keep abreast of what's going on in the broader world, because a lot of what's happening nowadays is really taking place in the commercial sector. And the DOD, unlike 20, 30 years ago, isn't necessarily where all the cutting edge software is being done. So we can learn an awful lot of things by paying attention to stuff like test-driven development, and continuous integration, continuous development. These are concepts that are very widely applied in the commercial world and are only slowly finding their way into a lot of the DoD programs where it's much more expensive to do those kinds of tests without having to go out into some kind of integration lab and, and spend a lot of money in, in hardware and platforms as opposed to simulators and emulators. So I'm hearing you talk a lot about investing in software as a critical enabler all through the technology and the people and the process, through recruiting, through the enabling technologies, through testing. Um, is that a fair assessment? Absolutely, yes. And, and this is a challenge because this has not been the way that the DOD has historically viewed their, their core competency and their value-added dimension. And it was with more and more systems becoming cyber-enabled and all the good and bad that that means in terms of new capability and also new threats, we have to be a lot more intentional and strategic about recognizing the intrinsic value of software as an artifact and more importantly, perhaps software as a profession that you want to reward and grow people into. Crosstalk, the Journal of Defense Software Engineering, recently had a, uh, an entire special issue dedicated to software engineering as a profession. Uh, so I will, um, I will encourage our readers to take, a, to take a look at that as well. We'll include links to that in the transcript. Um, Tom, would you like to talk about uh, you know, core enabling strategies or strategies that you recommend organizations explore and emphasize? Absolutely. Um, so <laughs> core strategies for me, uh, one of the, the, the bigger ones is, is that if you want these teams and these folks to be um, uh, able to transition among platforms and software technologies, there needs to be um, a system in place for that. And the simplest one, in my opinion, is having experienced domain um, uh, mentors uh, for, for, for developing the people. Um, you know, technology is there. There's lots of great stuff out there to pull in and incorporate, but it needs to you know, be evaluated for form and fit. And, you know, don't expect to just pull in new technologies because they're cool, but make sure they fit well into your effort. Um, and that's where a good mentor or leadership can, can, can help with that. And I'm big into the whole mentoring idea. So making sure that you have people that have that experience to make, create new people that have that experience and, and to, I don't say protect them, but I would say that, that software in at least this industry, in this space, um, has had a certain, um, utility rather than sexiness to it. Right. Um, it, everything I've worked on software is a bit of a, of an afterthought. The, 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 the cool stuff is this hardware, or this new technology, but putting it all together, oh, that's just magic. And so developing that understanding, as Doug has mentioned, that software is key and critical and is not an afterthought is, is a lesson that, that has to be um, more holistically embraced. I appreciate those insights. We've talked a lot about mentoring in particular in some of our other podcasts in this series. And um, I always appreciate uh, when the conversation comes comes back to that as we you know contribute to growing the growing the workforce that is doing this important work uh, for the long haul. So one um, one aspect of our work that we 
like to highlight in the podcast is uh, technology transition. And so if I'm on a team or if I'm managing a team that's recently been tasked to expand a mission to include you know, the real engi- these engineering and development activities, where should I start? What good resources uh, are available to me? Um, and I'll ask Tom to take the first pass at that. Oh, wow. Um, so my general response to that is that, you know, transition takes time. Patience is the most um, important resource in, in that sort of setting. Um, level setting and adjusting the priorities and incentives is important. And that must be understood by the management of those organizations. I, In terms of specific resources, I am not super knowledgeable of specific resources, but I will say that focusing on the resources that talk about um, uh, certain key elements, like the ones that value um, uh, planning and decomposition before an effort starts, ones that um, emphasize the non-functional attributes of an effort uh, are important. Um, you know, there are a lot of efforts for which the expectation is that you can turn on a dime, adjust, and th- produce a new, newly engineered software system. You know, in three months. And there any any resources that you look for that are about transitioning need to uh, uh, have a much more broad perspective on that and and plan for the uh, time it takes for that sort of transition. Um, I always like resources that focus on flexibility and self-organization in their process development and in their people development. Thanks, I appreciate that. Doug, do you want to uh, do you want to weigh in on uh, resources that you think managers who are making this transition should be looking toward as a first step? Sure, you bet. First, I think it's important to recognize one of the, the challenges of dealing with transition in the DoD historically has been that because of the requirements, because of the fact that these systems were often designed to be sustained for decades as opposed to uh, just a short amount of time, people are often forced to use older tools which are not as well supported with the kinds of things we'd come to expect if you're building an enterprise web system today. Most of the commercial practice, most of the tools from the major vendors like Microsoft and Google and Apple and so on are really focused on enterprise e-commerce style systems and web-based systems, whereas very little historically of what was going on in the DoD was done like that, especially when you're sustaining airport airplane platforms or ships or tanks or other kinds of weapon systems. So part of the challenge is to figure out what generation of technologies do people be, need to be aware of, and then how can they get the experience necessary to be successful. One obvious resource I'll point people to because it's one of the few places that focuses almost exclusively on this is our SEI blog, where we have articles over the past decade since 2011 that focus on the kinds of technologies, methods, tools, platforms, and so on that are necessary to be successful in the DoD. There are very few other resources out there that are publicly available that go into that amount of detail. So that's a wonderful resource to start with. It's also important, I think, to get people to learn modern quality assurance techniques, even if you're stuck using older languages and older platforms and older uh, operating systems and so on, you're still often well well, uh, poised to success if you can leverage modern quality assurance and testing techniques. So again, things like test-driven development, continuous integration, continuous deployment, those kinds of tools can be applied to almost any environment and you'll be much better off even if you're stuck writing your code or sustaining your code in Jovial or Fortran or lower level languages like C because those techniques and those environments are really very well versed to making people successful at catching a lot of bugs by leveraging It's one of the interesting implications of Moore's law, which is we have more and more transistors on a chip so we can run the computers and we can run the test environments readily 24 seven and do a really good job of automation of the quality assurance process. So my understanding is that you're continuing to develop uh, the blog post series, that there are uh, two of them now and that there are more coming. Um, I think they were both uh, a really great read. They, um, 
they reference uh, some really important work um, and they make the concepts uh, really easy to sort of sit down and break down and, and recognize challenges that, that you're encountering um, as you're, you know, as you're making changes in the organization. So I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what's next uh, in that line of work. Uh, so Doug and Tom, I want to thank you for talking to us today. Um, I've really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Uh, for our audience, we will include links in the transcript to all of the resources mentioned during today's podcast. And thanks again for joining us. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.